Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome back to the Hallian 7 tutorial series. Today we're going to have a look at a different kind of sample-based audio processing called spectral synthesis. Hope you're enjoying the series so far. If you are, check out the Patreon and YouTube channel member links below. Awesome way to help support my channel. And without further ado, let's make a start. I've initialized a spectral synth. And as you can see, drop sample here tells us what we need to do next. I'll head over to the media bay and I've selected this Slido 5 BB29. Drag the sample into the spectral processor and jump straight over to the sample tab so that we can hear it in its unadulterated form. So there are three distinct phases to this sample. One, two, three. When we jump back over to the spectral synth zone, you see a different kind of representation of those three phases. Obviously the third phase is the most visibly distinct, but there are quite clear differences between phases one and two. So what are we looking at with this heat map? It's a very unusual way to look at sound, and initially it can seem very unintuitive, but what you're seeing is a heat map of amplitude. The y-axis of a spectral map is frequency. So at the bottom of the map, we have the lowest frequencies, and up at the top, we have the highest. So in this sample, when we get into phase three, quite clearly a very dominant uh, low end sound, which is not quite so prevalent in the first two phases. The color represents how loud that particular frequency domain is. So you can see this um, yellow orange band running through phases one and two of the sample. That's at about 200 Hertz. I'll show you that in a different representation in a moment, but just concentrating on this band for, for now. That is a spectral representation of vibrato. If you discount everything else and you just look at that yellow orange band, what you're seeing there is vibrato. Because if we have frequency going up and down in a very consistent fashion, with a very consistent amplitude, because it's all the same color, I've just defined vibrato. If I click anywhere in this spectral map, you'll hear the sample. So if I click on the left-hand side, just listen to this vibrato-like flutter. The yellows are the hottest part of the signal. Then we fade into oranges and reds, and finally down into blues and purples, right at the very top end of the spectrum. All of the high frequency stuff, and this is very often the case with many sounds, high frequencies of sounds generally tail off. So all of this stuff at the top, this purple band, that's the highest frequencies. If you have a look in the spectrum analyzer down in the bottom right hand corner, let's try to map what this looks like with what we more traditionally see in a spectrum analyzer. I'm pressing C3 on the keyboard here. You can see C3 is the, the center point around which the sample's played. So the bumps in the spectrum analyzer, in other words, the highest points of amplitude, here's one at around 200 Hertz. I told you that this was about 200 Hertz, didn't I? Now you can see it in the spectrum analyzer, this biggest bump is the, the, the widest color, but we have other subsidiary bumps. Phase two of the sample is the clearest in which to see that. You can see as we phase through that second part, all of those mini bumps. Then as we transition into phase three, we're gonna have a dominance of bass sound. There it is. You can also see these little strobe lines that's effectively a visual representation of tremolo. So we have a consistent frequency distribution, looking at the top two thirds of this spectral map in the, in the final part of the sample. Let's just listen to that. That's tremolo. In this mid and upper range, we have a consistent frequency distribution. So the colored bands are pretty much the same size throughout the period, but they're turning on and off. Well, that's a, a high amplitude, low amplitude, repeated very regularly. I've just defined tremolo. So what you can see in this sample is a really good representation of vibrato and a really good representation of tremolo. Spectral maps are amazing tools for thinking about sound in a brand new way because you see so much information. You see all of the frequency distribution and the amplitude distribution in one single hit. What you see in the map there is basically an equivalent of watching a spectrum analyzer and remembering every single snapshot of the spectrum analyzer as it goes through time. So there's vastly more information in this than you get in the spectrum analyzer, which is basically a representation of one period of time. I'm not gonna say one moment in time, because as I've said previously in this series, the concept of instantaneous tone makes absolutely no sense. 
you need to listen to sound over a period of time in order to make sense of the, the various frequencies in it. Now, ultimately, we're going to get on to play with this stuff. The reason why we have a spectral synthesizer is because it's a different way of approaching sound and it has its own tonal characteristics. But I think it's good to take a few minutes to just really have a think about what's going on because it's such, a, it's such an unusual and esoteric concept. It's really easy to gloss over this stuff and not really understand what you're seeing or doing. We'll use one final analysis tip before we get into the nuts and bolts of the synthesizer itself. I'm going to jump over to the analysis tab. What you see in this graph is a traditional spectrum analyzer. What you're seeing is the spectrum analyzer at the moment in time represented by this little white line, or more accurately, a window of time around that little white line. The window that we're going to use to draw our spectrum graph is going to be a hand window. See this window type down here? At the top of the window type, we have rectangular. Rectangular window functions have huge problems because they uh, inherently introduce distortion. If I toggle between hand windows and rectangular windows and play the same sample, you'll hear that the rectangular is much harsher. It introduces a lot of audio artifacts into the sound. Let's have a go at that. Start off with the hand window. So we're just listening to this period of time at the end of the sample now. Let's listen to a rectangular. Hear all that noisy flutter see it in the spectrum analyzer as well. Look at the high frequency distribution as opposed to the rectangular, which is much noisier. Noise would basically be a horizontal line of essentially consistent, consistently variable frequencies. And you can hear all of that nasty flutter. That's because the window over which we're analyzing these samples as we scan through time um, have no zero points on the left and right boundaries. That's going to introduce aliasing. That's going to manifest as sound. That's a half hour conversation all in its own right. Generally speaking, hand window is your friend. A good rule of thumb to think about window types is that rectangular have the best frequency analysis. They're very good at identifying frequency and components in tone, but very bad at combining those window types together over time. So you get a very accurate analysis, but a very low quality of integration of all of those windows. Down at the bottom of this list, we have the opposite to that. The poorest frequency analysis with the smoother sounds. And it's all about what the frequency distribution of your sound is. It's such a big subject, I can't really get into it today. And for many samples that you import into the spectral synthesizer, Han is going to be absolutely fine and you will struggle to hear very, very subtle differences between them, but it's certainly worth experimenting. Window functions are a fascinating subject to study as an academic exercise. So this spectral graph represents this moment in time. If I jump somewhere else in the sample, I'm going to get a different spectrum graph. This is now the frequency distribution of the period of time that this window covers at this moment in the sample. And you can see the sound evolve. So the heat map is showing you every single representation that this spectrum analyzer is going to show you over the course of this sample being played. All right then, that's our overview of spectral analysis done. Let's start back at the beginning. We're in our oscillator tab here, looking at the whole heat map. What can we do with this sample? We want to do some interesting stuff with it. Well, as was the case with both wavetables and granular synthesis, we can control how quickly we scan through this sample. At the moment, we have a direction of 100, which basically means we're gonna scan through the sample at its native resolution. And if we set the speed to 100 as well, those two values combined basically make the, the sample playback at normal speed, but we could go backwards. And what we're going to start from whatever this sample position is currently set to. Now it sounds like a Looney Tunes kind of comedy sound. Here's our position control. This is the same as picking up the white line and physically moving it somewhere else in the sample. I accomplish that with the position control. Let's set myself back to moving forwards. We have our acceleration control, so we could start off more slowly and then accelerate towards a faster target speed. Let's pull the position back. Slow and fast as we accelerate. Control click to reset acceleration and target and speed back to their defaults. So we've seen all of those controls in different zones of the synthesizer, so nothing particularly unusual yet. The real meat of spectral synthesis 
comes in these two controls, in my opinion. Purity and inharmonicity, a very difficult word to say, really define how this sample is going to get played back by the spectral synthesizer. And if you can understand these two controls and get a really good intuitive grasp of them, you're going to understand spectral synthesis. And this is basically the nuts and bolts of the whole process. Let's deal with purity first. Purity manages the volume or amplitude of different harmonics or partials in a sample. At zero, which is its default value, there's no manipulation of this being made so we're hearing the sample played back normally. Think of it like a seesaw, where the seesaw determines the relative amplitude of all of the frequencies in a sound. Now, if the fundamental is the lowest frequency of sound, if we tip it all the way so that we can only hear the fundamental, you've basically just described a sine wave. You've thrown away all of your other harmonics. If you tip it the other way, however, if you go into negative territory, you bring the seesaw up to a horizontal level. Now you've basically just described noise. So we have zero, which is the normal sound, 100 or maximum, which is effectively a sine wave, and minus 100, which is effectively noise. So now if we play with the purity control, we'll be able to see that in the spectrum analyzer. So if I just play the beginning of the sample to get some kind of consistency, there's the slope, the standard frequency distribution of all of the harmonics over that fairly consistent period of time. Okay, turn the purity all the way up to maximum. The slope gets steeper and steeper, We're throwing away more and more harmonics and we're almost down to just a sine wave. Look at that in the oscilloscope. It's pretty accurately sine wave. There are still other harmonics in there. We don't completely abandon them all. Now we go to minus 100. Spectral graph is effectively horizontal. Look at it in the oscilloscope. Absolute chaos reigns. Basically just describe noise. So once again, we're manipulating the relative amplitude of the different frequencies in the signal. We're not completely abandoning them. We're using that spectral DNA, the information that's contained in the sample, and we're pushing it one way or another. We're distorting that information for tonal effect. Let's get back to zero, control click. Now let's have a chat about inharmonicity. So this value defaults to 100. Again, if I control click, it's gonna set it to 100. What inharmonicity does is identifies the distribution of the various harmonics in the sound. Again, at any moment in time, let's jump here. So every time I press a key now, we're gonna start playing the sample back at exactly this moment. See all these bumps? They represent different accentuations of particular frequencies. So this sound at this moment in time has what, six, seven, however many really distinct frequency bumps, and each one of those, they all add together, they define the sound that we hear. Let's jump forward in the sample to listen to this bass stuff at the end. Now we have a completely different frequency distribution of all of those harmonics. It's much more consistent as far as the spectrum analyzer is concerned. And you can see that consistency re represented in the map as well. Very heavy yellow, fading gradually up to blue at the, at the, the high end of the frequencies. But this sound is actually quite enharmonic. It has sine waves in the, um, in the frequency distribution that aren't a multiple of the fundamental. In other words, they're enharmonic. The inharmonicity control allows those enharmonic overtones to be heard. If I set this value to zero, now only linear multiples of the fundamental will be allowed and the sound will sound much smoother. When I reintroduce those enharmonic overtones, listen to the pitch of the sound change as I turn this control up. That low stuff is enharmonic. It's not the same pitch as the fundamental. So Hallian is identifying the frequency distribution of this sound, deciding what the fundamental is. That's primarily going to be a mathematical concept. What's the loudest tone? That's the fundamental. And then it's going to say, well, if that was, let's say, oh, so 65, okay, in this case, then only multiples of 65, in other words, 130, 195, and so on. They're the only frequencies that are going to be allowed through. Harmonics that don't occur on that linear map are going to be discarded. If we turn this value into negative territories, we're going to accentuate 
the enharmonic overtones and we'll abandon the more harmonic series based on the fundamental. And now I'm playing C on the keyboard. Tuna has no idea what's going on because the fundamentals disappeared. Now it's closer to a G sharp. So with inharmonicity set to zero and purity set to 100, we're going to get as close as we can. We're going to approach a sine wave. There we go. That's really not a bad representation of a sine wave. With those two controls, you basically know everything you need to know about spectral synthesis. That is why we've gone to all of the effort of importing a sample into a spectral map to play with these two controls. I'll show you another example of these two controls in use in a different context. Let's get our media bay back again. And this time I'm gonna pull up a saxophone sound. So I'll just initialize the synthesizer so that I've thrown all those changes away. And I'm gonna import this outtake saxophone B flat, 130 BPM. Drop that into my sample. It's all very well and good, but I just want to pick on one note. I'm just going to play this note. Let's just play the sample back naturally. Now let's play with the purity value. If I increase purity, I'm going to throw away some of those overtones, and I think it's going to start sounding a little bit more like a clarinet, because clarinets have fewer overtones than a saxophone, but they're in the same family of instrument. If I introduce more overtones, it's going to start sounding more like a trumpet because trumpets have a higher frequency distribution than saxophones. Isn't sound magical? Throw some of those enharmonic overtones away. We call that a flute. Magical stuff and great fun. Let's reset both of those controls back to default. And we'll stick with the saxophone for now. Let's have a look at a couple of the other tabs. Over on the filter page, the spectral synthesizer has its own filter bank. Let's engage it. And now we have a multi-point uh, filter to play with. By default, we only have two nodes, one at the very beginning, one at the end. We can't do anything with those, they're fixed. I can cycle through nodes one and two and you can see the little pink box changing but I can add extra nodes onto the filter map by double clicking and now it's quite clear what I'm doing to the spectral graph I'm basically applying an EQ curve and this filter curve is going to apply to the entire spectrum remember when we were looking at wavetables you can apply filters to each individual entry in a wavetable that's not the case here this filter is going to apply to the entire sample so I've just scooped away a load of the bass sound and we're accentuating the frequencies around 500. Honky nasal central. If I select multiple of these nodes, I can right click and I've got various options. I can invert gain, invert frequency. I can duplicate and paste somewhere else. Paste multiple copies of the of whatever was in my memory at the time. And then obviously I've got control over all of those. I've got a dedicated low cut where I can throw away all the bass frequencies. Don't forget, I was playing this as if, it, as if it was a saxophone, but it is the full saxophone lick that I imported. I basically just kind of focused in on that section. If I wanted to go into the sample page, I could reduce the sample end so they only played the part of the sample that I was interested in. We've seen these sample options in many different guises. Again, this is where we can control loops and all of those kinds of good things. I'm going to turn that filter off because that was pretty violent stuff. There's my saxophone sound again. So at the moment we have transient detection engaged, which is primarily good for percussive sounds. Now this saxophone sound isn't a, a transient based sound, so I might be tempted to turn it off but I'm going to load a drum pattern now in to show you the difference between transient detection on and off. 
Again, I'll just initialize my program so, so I'm not polluted with anything that I've done previously. So I've selected this trap hat loop uh, 0970 BPM. Let's drop that into the sample viewer. It sounds like this. Very transient heavy. Back over to the analysis page. I'm going to turn this up so that you can hear it as clearly as possible. As I turn transient on and off, just have a listen to how fuzzy the transients get with transient detection disengaged. So on first. It's lost a lot of snap. The last thing I wanted to show you today, I'm going to go back to my original sample, slide 05BB29. Let's drop that back in again. Here's our old friend. Is this row of controls at the top of the oscillator page? If we engage Legato, it means if I press multiple keys on the keyboard, I don't restart the sample each time, as opposed to get a completely different sound. So those keys are basically jumping on the sample wherever they happen to be in time. So I'm playing a chord there, you can see in the virtual keyboard down below. One, two, three four different notes, they're all jumping onto the train as it's moving forwards. If I engage hold and my envelope type is sustain, which it usually is, that's the default, this means when the sample gets to the end of playback, it'll start playing the last representation, whatever that final window contains, whatever's basically the last entry in the wavetable will get played over and over again. It's very quiet, but it is there. That's the last entry in the wavetable. We can generate a stereo pan effect by introducing channel spread. Now this particular sound is a mono sample. Have a look in the sample viewer. There's the mono sample. But if I engage channel spread, it's going to duplicate the sound. And now if I introduce a spread, it's basically going to offset the playback of one of those tones. You see this really easily in the oscilloscope. Let's go to stereo bus. So I'll play channel spread with zero spread. You can see that those two waves are identical. Now introduce a spread. You can really clearly hear that stereo effect. And if we look in the oscilloscope, now one of those waves has been offset. You can't really catch it in the oscilloscope because you're only seeing five cycles of something that's cycling at what, 230 times a second, 250 times a second. If I had an enormous range of oscilloscope to show you, we'd basically be able to find those the size of the offset eventually. But that's basically what's happening, one side's being offset. If we increase the spread dramatically, you can very easily hear that the right-hand side is basically finishing playing before the left-hand side does. And you can see the two spectral lines passing through the, uh, passing through the sample as well. And finally, we've got our good old friend Multi, where we basically introduce multiple voices and the whole thing starts sounding incredible. Let's turn this spread down a little bit. It was a bit dramatic, wasn't it? Awesome stuff. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Please hit like if you did. I'll see you next time. Thanks very much.